Is it fantasy or faith? That's the big question. Is it daydreaming or is it a true reality, a true believing for you? You see, today's text is unfolding for us and understanding that this question is so important to answer within our own heart and life. We need to understand, is it fantasy or is it faith? Is it a daydream or is it true believing? You see, that's the question every manifestation in life is waiting for you to answer. That's right, the answer to your prayer. It's waiting for you. It's already there. Why? Because we know in Scripture that says, God knows the desires of your heart even before you ask. That desire has already been prepared. The desire is already ready for you. It's waiting for you. But what it's waiting for is that wonderful confidence, that assurance, that great belief in the reality that it is so, that wonderful sense of peace that is a substance that ushers in the manifestation. It's waiting for you to say in that powerful yes, that affirming way, that wonderful energy that's within you that says, I believe it is so. It is the unobstructed yes that's so important. Because it says that the pathway is clear within your spirit, within your life, within the power of your great faith. You say, I live in the power of yes. Yes, it's happening. Yes, I know it. Yes, I believe it. Yes, I live as if it is so. This is what's so important for our life. Otherwise, many of the things that we think about in life, they're simply fantasies. We fantasize, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to be prosperous? Hmm, that sounds like a lovely thought. Would it be wonderful to be healthy and whole? Sounds like a great thought. But those become fantasies and daydreams. When reality calls, it requires great faith that says, I am whole, I am blessed, I am prosperous. And how powerful it is that whatever you're putting behind the I am or that follows the I am, so you are. Because the I am that I am is that powerful name of the presence of God within your life. So what it's looking for in life, the great manifestation is waiting, watching, observing almost, that great deliverance of all the wonderful gift that is waiting for you in the answer for your prayer. It's waiting for that offer, uh, affirmation that says there is no obstacle in my pathway, that your mind is confident, confident. Now my daughter, competed in the Miss Georgia pageant. She was Miss Georgia in the year 2008. And she had several coaches who would constantly affirm within her this. You have to walk on that stage ready to receive the crown. Not someone who's fantasizing about thinking about receiving the crown. Not someone who believes and says, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful someday to be Miss Georgia? Walking out and thinking the someday. But it's so different when you walk out on the stage knowing that you are the winner. You walk in that kind of confidence. It's this unobstructed yes that you're putting out there. That there's no hesitation, there's no reservation. I know that I know that I am. Now, many people would say, well, that's a scary thought because what if you're not? But if you walk in that confidence that you are the winner, you'll always be the winner. Whether you get a tiara or not, whether you get a title or not, that's the whole journey of life. It's the calling of saying, are you ready to walk in that kind of confidence? Because this is the difference. Otherwise, well, it's simply a daydream. It's simply a fantasy within our lives. The answers to our prayers are already there. And God is then simply waiting for that wonderful energy of release within our lives that's simply saying, yes, yes, I know, yes, I receive. The desire of the universe is always for our highest and best. God wants your highest and best. Now today, some people looked at that text that we read or that wonderful devotional that talked about money. And some people in the past who've read that have visited with me and said, ooh, that sounds scary. Now we're all about money, 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 money. But did you read what you said? It said money is God's a tool for us that we work through. We don't worship it. We don't uh, say that we're greedy in the context of that we're all about money. But we use the tools that God has given to us for our prosperity. We know that God's desire is for you to be prosperous. Do you think God intends for you to be poor? Do you think God intends for you to suffer? Do you think God intends for you to be unhealthy? 
Do you think these are the intentions of the divine love of God that's flowing in this universe? We know it's not true. We know that God wants your highest and best. It's already there. And the spiritual law says, as you believe, so shall you receive. So if we know God's desire is there, God's simply waiting to say, as you believe, are you believing? So shall you receive. And to the degree in which you believe, to the level of your belief, not that kind of maybe, but a full assurance. This is this text offering us that faith is something that's filled with confidence. Faith is something that is so strong. It is now living out a reality. Faith is this wonderful energy that you put out that is the unobstructed yes. You see, this is a really big deal. It's a really big deal. Understanding faith, it'll transform your whole life. If we don't understand the power of our faith, we don't understand how to utilize our faith, we don't understand how to put it into action, we never really are great manifestors. We're never really those who bring about God's highest and best in our lives. We don't do it to the fullest because that limited faith, that hesitant faith, or the lack of the use of any kind of faith at all hinders our success within our walk with our li and life. So today's text is speaking this assurance, this wonderful confidence that you say, and so it is. So many of us can be lost in this daydreaming, indulging in fantasies. And faith is not a place of being lost. Lost in a fantasy, lost in daydreaming, lost. How many of you have spent hours daydreaming? We all can relate to that. Maybe while you're driving, you've been spending hours of daydreaming on a long trip. And maybe you were daydreaming so much, you said, whoa, wait a minute, where have I been the last five miles? I mean, who's been driving the car? Because I was daydreaming. I was lost someplace else. I wasn't present in the moment at all in that daydream context. Well, let me tell you this. Faith is not lost Faith is present. Faith is in the now. Faith is in the moment. It's not off dreaming of the someday one day. Because sometimes we get into that place where we're kind of living out this fantasy of, oh, wouldn't it be great if it was one day? But know that one day is today. That one day is now. That's what faith is all about. Jesus was not daydreaming or fantasizing when he was feeding the 5,000. I can't imagine him holding that basket and thinking, Oh, wouldn't it be lovely if everybody was fed right now? Oh, wouldn't that be a beautiful thought? Wouldn't it be lovely if everyone had fishes and loaves? Hmm, someday, maybe. But no, he actually with confidence and assurance and living in the reality broke the bread in front of all those hungry people. Now, can you imagine? Wait a minute, we're starving and you're breaking bread? And you're not going to share? Of course the intention was to share. And the belief that there would be enough for everyone. You see, that's the kind of confidence that he acted out in. I'm sure on the day of the wedding at Cana, it wasn't daydreaming or fantasies thinking, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if we had an extra Merlot or a wonderful dry white wine right now? We need something here. Wouldn't that be lovely? Something with a smooth finish. And thinking maybe someday at the wedding we'll have that. Maybe sometime... It, no, Jesus was walking in assurance and confidence, telling the servants, you get those pots that have been used for Jewish purification. You fill them up to the brim with water and now go out and serve that wine to the steward and to the ruler of the banquet. And like, whoa, that's got to be confident. That's got to be an unobstructed yes that this is what's transpiring within his life and within the miraculous flowing in and through his life. There's no daydreaming. There's no fantasy. It's living this uh, wonderful truth in the moment because sometimes in fantasy and in daydream, we really don't expect it to happen. Now, that can be one of the problems in our prayers. We can pray and then we say, whoa, it happened. I didn't expect it to happen. You know, like, whoa, how did that happen? How did that work out? Because I didn't even expect it. And sometimes people have responded and say, I wasn't expecting the miraculous to unfold. I wasn't expecting this to happen for me. You see, that's when we fall into the category then. Maybe we were just doing some spiritual daydreaming, a little fantasizing about what God could do and maybe do. But when there's this level of expectation, faith shifts our whole life shifts 
to this wonderful uh, understanding that it is so and it is unfolding here and now. You imagine the occurrence and you fantasize about it sometimes and we simply play these games in our heads that we don't put enough thought energy into believing. And I'm talking about thought energy. That's what your faith is when you focus your very thought, your mind, your consciousness on the reality. It says this is the divine hand of work, uh, work of God at work right now. The divine hand of God is working right now. I know it. I feel it. I sense it. I just express it. I claim it. All that powerful thought energy that we put in is transforming our lives. And this is one, a kind of faith that you say that you know then is to be real. In the phrase of this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The assurance, the confidence. We gave you several different words that you could choose from because sometimes in the course of life, certain words hit better with someone, resonate better with someone. It's a problem of semantics we live in our world. So I've given you several words that you could use that are offered in translations. This is faith is the reality. Faith is the confidence, the assurance. And one of the big words is saying faith is the substance of that which is is. Uh, not yet seen, but are going to unfold for your life the very evidence for you. When we look at that word substance, that means it is the uh, faith that undergirds what we've imagined. Faith is that defining word that says it undergirds. It's a substance that you stand on. It's what forms your foundation. You might say it's the cement, it's the rock that you stand on. It's that which is anchoring you or grounding you. Substance stands for or means that which stands under. So you might look and say, what are you standing on? What's underneath you? What's anchoring you? What's grounding you? When you walk in faith, what's below you? What is the foundation? Well, we walk in faith. We walk on those promises of God, claiming them every day and with every step those very spiritual laws that say, as you sow, so shall you reap. All these wonderful truths. This is how we begin to walk. And we have to ask ourselves, are we walking in fantasy, walking on something that, oh, I don't really know, I'm not sure, or maybe someday, or wouldn't it be nice if, all those kind of things, or daydreaming it could possibly be sometime. Then there's a difference with saying, I walk on the substance the assurance, the confidence, the knowing that all things are working together for my good right here and now. This helps us develop a conviction, a conviction. What's a conviction? A conviction is something that you would willing, be willing to die for. That you, not just simple belief that could be passed on or overlooked, but a conviction is something that grabs you, grabs you. It's not something you're trying to grab onto, but it grabs you. I've had lots of people who say, I have a conviction. And years ago in the Pentecostal church, I grew up, people said, I have a conviction that women should not wear pants. And then, you know, five years later, they're all wearing pants. Oh, and I have a conviction. Women should not wear lipstick. And five years later, they're all wearing lipstick. And uh, I have a conviction. I'm convicted that we shouldn't dance. And five years later, they're all dancing. And I'm like, wow, wow, I thought these were convictions. Are they really convictions or are they someone's ideas or beliefs that they imparted to you? You don't really believe them. You don't really hold on to them. They don't hold on to you. There's a big difference. Something that's a conviction is deep within your heart and life. The Boston Whaler is a boat that's made in Florida. It's a well-known uh, brand uh, because it is listed as the unsinkable boat. And people will buy this boat because they have this confidence, this great conviction that says it's unsinkable. Now, the maker of the boat will tell you how it's unsinkable because it has a double hull and it's filled with a foam. You can cut this boat in half and it won't sink. You can do all kinds of things to this boat and it still won't sink. It is the unsinkable boat. It's not some fantasy like the Titanic. It is a reality that is a conviction people have that says, I want that boat because I know that I know that I know it's the unsinkable boat. It is filled with some 
a, a foam within it that enables it to stay afloat at all times. So too, we have to ask ourselves, what are you filled with? Is there a conviction that fills your life? A conviction that says, I know it's true. I believe it to be so. All things are working together for my good. I know that that which I pray for, the answer is already there. And so I live the answer. I live with that confidence. I live in that power of that believing. That conviction is so important that you are grounded on something very strong within your life. It has to be something inside you. One of the challenges we have in developing those convictions and this kind of faith is we have to learn how to believe. Now, one of our problems is a lot of churches will tell you what to believe. But have we learned how to believe? Big difference there. A lot of pastors will say, let's believe this, or let's read this creed, or this dogma, and this is what we will say we believe. But how do we believe? Who teaches us how to believe in the journey of life? How to have this kind of faith and exercise it? Have we really taught people that journey? So let's take some time and learn how to believe today. Number one, how you learn, or the beginning of learning how to believe, I should say, is that we begin to understand the very promises and laws of God. That's the beginning. When you look at every promise or every spiritual law, it says, when you sow, you reap. Okay? And we know that to be true in nature. We also know that to be true in our spiritual lives. That is a law. Laws are unchangeable. We know laws within our life that when you put yellow with blue, you always get pink. No, no, you don't, do you? What does the law say? What do you always get? Green, of course. Now, has anyone ever put yellow and blue and gotten another shade or another color, another? No, because the law says that when you put this and this together, you're going to get that. Now, we know that in coloring in school and in art class. Yet that same principle is true for our lives every single day. That when we live out the promise of God, the law of God that says, as you believe, as you believe, so shall you receive. So we need to put the power of believing into action. When we understand all of these wonderful laws, these very promises for us, that speak about our generosity, that speak about sowing and reaping, that speak about sharing of love, that speak about doing unto others as we'd like to have them done to us, things done unto us. When we think of all these laws that are at work within our life, they are simply the very promises of God, and they enable us to say, you know what, I know they're true, and I believe them. I want you to go on the rooftop and please step off the roof, taking one gentle step and begin to walk through space, if you don't believe gravity, I'd like to see what happens. But I'm going to tell you this. It's going to make you a firm believer in the law of gravity. And I want you to know that what the Scripture invites you to do is to test then these laws. Test them. Scripture invites you to say, prove. It's beautiful without Scripture. God's saying, yes, go ahead, put it to work. Just try it out. Try the law of gravity, but let's importantly, let's try some spiritual laws. Let's try these very promises of God. Let's say they're there. The very promise of tithing that says, as you give to the storehouse that nurtures you and strengthens you, that spiritual home, there is blessing that comes to you. And it says, prove it, try it, test it out. Because as you give, so shall you receive is a spiritual law and will be at work in your life. One of our problems is we don't believe is because we haven't tested those laws. We haven't really put them to test. We haven't challenged them. So I'm going to invite you in the journey of learning to believe is to say, what could I believe for that I'm going to test? I'm going to try the very law of God, the very promise of God. I'm going to believe for something, and I'm going to test it. I'm going to put it out there and just say, you know what? I am believing this, and I'm going to put all my energy into believing it, and I'm going to really put it to work and I'm going to see how the law of God unfolds for me. I'm going to allow it to work within my life. Because the more we put these laws into practice, the more then the power of our faith 
and our power to believe for something unfolds for us. Now, in this learning how to believe, how to believe journey, it requires something. It requires someone being of one mind, not wavering, not divided, not uh, fluctuating, not one time in, one time out, saying today I believe, tomorrow I don't believe, next day, well, maybe I'll go back to believing, next day, oh, I'm not going to believe, this kind of wavering back and forth. Learning how to believe says I will be consistent in that which I proclaim, even consistent to the point of I'll be patient as I know the unfolding of the answer is coming to me. I'll be patient. This past few weeks, Robert and I have been busy out in the yard planting tulips. And a neighbor came by and said, what are you doing planting all those bulbs? Are we going to see tulips next week? No. Are we see tulips uh, next month? No. Will I see tulips a month after that? No. Well, when are we going to see tulips? And why are you going to all this work if we're not going to see tulips for a long time? It says, patience. Because the tulips will bloom in the right and perfect season. And we'll all enjoy the blooms together. But it requires us to be patient. So that unwavering faith is you plant the seed and you don't say, well, it didn't bloom today. It didn't bring out a, a promise of, of unfolding its goodness today. I planted the seed in prayer and I give up and I quit. But it's the unwavering faith that says, I know that I know that I know. And I live and act in this kind of consciousness that says, it is happening and I live as if it's my reality. So learning out of faith is based, I know these promises of God. I know these principles. I know these spiritual laws. I test them. I see them at work. And I'm patient while I'm waiting for them to fully unfold for my life. And we also know that it's the Spirit of God at work within us. It's not us. We're not doing magic. It's not us creating something. It's the Spirit of God at work within us. Our faith is allowing that divine presence that's deep within our life to unfold the highest and best as it intends to. But God wants that highest and best, but awaits for you to give permission. To give permission that unobstructed yes, living in that assurance, living in that confidence, that, some, that spirit of knowing that says, I live as if and so it is. Faith is this powerful energy of believing. It is the substance of things hoped for. The very substance of this faith is this wonderful believing thoughts and energy, believing lifestyle then that you begin to live. So learning how to believe is knowing those promises, understanding them, studying them. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 invites us to understand this. If when you meditate on the law, the promises of God, both day and night, you will be like a tree planted by the waters that will flourish and prosper, and its leaf will not wither. This is the beautiful promise of God. So the more we then learn to believe, we learn it by meditating on the law, contemplating it, thinking about these promises, getting them over and over in our head. This is, oh, I understand how God works. I understand how the spiritual principles are at work within my life. I get this. And the more I meditate on it, the more I think about it, the more it becomes part of how I live and operate within this universe. It becomes then how I act. And it affects our actions. It affects how we respond to crisis and stress and problems. It affects all kinds of things within our life, but it affects it for good. So it is this kind of thinking that is a consciousness filled with intentional thoughts, intentional that says, I know, I believe, and so it is. It's a consciousness that's there that's deep rising from within us, deep within. You know, there's a difference between the consciousness of thought that comes through us, and then there's our deep underlying subconscious. A subconscious, that which is deep within, that's full of all the experiences where sometimes you react from your subconscious without even thinking, you know? We react to certain things because the subconscious has maybe taught us a certain thing. Maybe we struggle with racism because we have had an experience and the subconscious 
then says, every time I encounter a person who's different than me, I bristle, I'm frightened, I think they're going to do something, they're going to rob or mistreat me. We have that reaction that's subconsciously there. So it is more that we put into our thought of meditating both day and night upon the principles of God. We impart this law that when something happens to you and you're diagnosed with some sort of sickness, you say, okay, instantly from the subconscious, you say, I already know the principles and the law. I claim my healing and I live from that perspective and I know that God is at work. My partner is struggling now. This is his sixth year of cancer, stage four cancer being diagnosed. And so we began to just say, let's test the law. Let's begin to pray. The doctor says, you know, it's stage four because we've tried every medicine we can come to think of. We don't know where, where to go anymore, so we're just going to consider you stage four and let's just let Robert live his life as comfortably as we can and we're going to give him over to palliative care to say whatever medicine or whatever care he may need give it to him freely and liberally as much as possible because that's all we can do and i said no i know that i know that i know god has a pathway and that there's healing that can come in many different shapes and forms and as i began to pray and began to believe i'm sitting in front of the television watching the evening news it's nbc news announcing a brand new cancer drug that has just come to america one that has not been tried and on the list of what it does it works on tumors it works on people who struggle with the kind of cancer that robert has I just jumped up and said, let me Google this quickly because I got so excited I forgot to write the name of the drug down. And so I said, NBC News. And I'm like, oh, come on, a new drug. Uh, I'm going to find it. I'm going to find And there it pops up on the screen. And I printed it out. And uh, I gave it to uh, Dr. David Carter, who was going to take Robert to the hospital. I said, present this to the doctor. Now, this is crazy. I'm telling the doctor what to do. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, you know, you would think the doctors know everything. And like, what am I going to be bold and brass and say, doctor, I'm going to tell you what you need to do? So I just said, oh, we're praying over this. I had a meeting, so I couldn't go with them to the doctor. But David and Robert went this week, and they began and said, presented this paper to the doctor. And the doctor said, okay. Stepped out of the room for 20 minutes. Got a little huddle of all the doctors together. Came back in the room, we're going to try this. We're going to do it. It looks good. This could be working. I said, could be. It is. And we're just claiming right now that if it's this or something better is unfolding for him, but this is a pathway of awakening to say there are possibilities because the doctors were saying to us, we've exhausted everything. And I said, no. I know that I know. I have the confidence. I have the assurance. I live in the reality. I live in this truth. I test the law that says, as I believe, so shall I receive. And I believe that there's a pathway for healing for Robert. Amen? Amen. And so we're looking for this drug to unfold. We're excited about what's going to happen in the next few months as the, they do this approach. Robert will be the very first person in the world who's ever used this drug for this type of cancer that Robert has. So I said, God uses us in all kinds of ways to open doors for others. How exciting that is that, Robert, you may be the one who opens the doors for many others who are struggling with disease and illness and sickness, that it unfolds for them too, and you are the test. And you get to be the one that says, I stood on the promises of God that God is making a way when there seems, to doctors, that there is no other way, but there is. And that's the beauty of faith. Of this type when we put it in action some amazing things happen for our lives because we allow the image of our thoughts that which we're praying for to sink in this is the power of believing and learning how to believe you allow it to sink in you know sometimes we have these prayer requests and we like to force them a little bit come on God come on God come on God you know I have a Good friend of Robert and I, he, is, he was working at the Lowe's Garden Department. His name is John, and he was the assistant at Lowe's in the Garden Department. And he saw Robert all the time, and he is a good man of, of Christian faith. And he said, let me pray for Robert. And so he would pull Robert aside uh, in the Garden Department, and we would pray over in the corner, and he would say, come on, God, don't let me down. Come on, God, come on. I want a healing. Come on, God. You know, you know. and he was like, 
cheering God on as if, you know, God needed some sort of pep talk, you know. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it, God. Now, don't let me down. You know, and it was his kind of like expression of saying, you know, I need to coach God into awakening and doing this for me. And we appreciated his gracious prayers. But I want to tell you this. This is where you pray with faith that you drop anchor and you let it sink. Because the anchor needs to hit bottom to do its work. Do you ever see a ship with an anchor and you're, it's attached to the side of the body of the ship? Maybe they're all rolled up in the crane, all rolled up in the chain. It's not doing its work, is it? It's not anchoring anything. It's not holding the ship in its place. So this kind of faith says, I drop anchor. I allow it to sink to the ground of my believing. I say this in such assurance and positivity and belief that I know that I know that I know I drop anchor right now and I let it sink to the ground of my faith, of my substance, of that which I walk on, stand on, and believe. And my ship is anchored in all storms when I let the anchor sink. I want to tell you this, but that's the power of praying and believing. You don't need to force it. You don't need to shove it. You just allow it. We allow it to rest on the bottom to anchor, to hold its place. And I want to say that this is the very truth of the Spirit speaking to us. When you pray, release and let go. Now, quite often when we pray, you'll hear those phrases, and I release this into the universe to act out. I release this. I let it go. Because what's important is you've got to let go of this issue that you're working with, that you're praying for, that you're believing for, you're trusting God for. You've got to let go of it. Otherwise, why? You hold on to the anchor and your ship is being tossed to and fro because you have not released and let go. You still hold on to it. So you pray and you say, I release and I let go. I release this into the universe. I release this into the hands of God. I release this into the divine presence. I release this knowing, knowing. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to stress about it. I can move on to something else. I think that's so wonderful when we think about the things that we could be praying for. And we say, I prayed for that already. I release it. I let it go. I'm with great patience. I already know the answer is coming. I prove it. I test it. I stand on this very principle and allow the very work of God to do its work in its right and perfect time. And now I can move on. What else could I pray for? I'm moving on to something else. I can believe for something else. I can trust God for something else unfolding for us. I believe that it's unfolding in another way, uh, another divine way. And when we begin to do this, it is the power of that releasing and letting go that we're not holding thoughts, we're holding things in thought. Let me distinguish that. Sometimes you're holding a thought. I sure hope God answers this prayer. Come on, God, don't let me down. Come on, come on. You can do it, God. I know you can. Come on, come on. And we're begging and we're cheering and we're coaching. We think we're at an Alabama game and we're like going on or we think we're there at the United and we're come, come on team, come on team. Go, go, go. We've got to be a cheerleader somehow for it. I'm going to tell you this. When you just simply are no longer holding that need but holding in thought the promise, the law at work, it's a big difference because there's holding in a way that you haven't released. And then there's holding in thought the knowing that I have released it. And I already see that something is happening. Our imagination then has moved from fantasy to now a reality that says, I see the answer already completed. I see it finished. And I begin to hold on to that. So I said, okay, let's try this. Let's test God a little bit. I said, let's move on to the next thing. Lord, I have this beautiful house. And I have a huge front yard, lots of grass to mow. I would love to see a sidewalk coming out from that front door going out to the street. Because when you come to my house, you may look and say, I see a front door, but how do I get there? Does the pastor want me to walk across the grass? Does he want to walk across the lawn? I can't see the sidewalk. Now, the homes in our subdivision were built in a way that they expected you to pull in the driveway, off the driveway, along the front of the house is a small sidewalk 
somewhat hidden by the landscaping and many of the homes, and so you can't see, how do I get there? I said, well, you know, I believe in the spirit of hospitality. I want my house and home to demonstrate the spirit of what I believe in, and that's, you are welcome, come on in. Well, it doesn't look very welcoming if there's no access to the front door. How are they going to get in there? I said, Lord, I want a sidewalk. Okay. I said, I'm believing for a sidewalk. Now, it sounds kind of silly. But I said, this is kind of an unusual request. You know, because pastors, we will pray for people for healing. We pray for the, how about pray for a sidewalk? I have never done that. I'll have you tell me. But I'm praying for a sidewalk. I began to believe for this sidewalk. So we called the sidewalk masons to come out. And they quoted us the price. Ooh, what? Uh, oh, oh, I, uh, cement is how much? Oh, oh, it's going to cost how much? Wow, okay, that was a little bit more than I was thinking. I thought a simple sidewalk, you know, poor little cement. Can't be that expensive, can it? Well, they quoted the price. And I said, okay. Robert said to me, how are we going to get this sidewalk? You want a crazy sidewalk to the front door? I said, God will make a way. So you know what I did? I just began to walk in believing. I took the dog out the front door and walked down my sidewalk. And Robert said, what are you doing? I said, I'm walking on my sidewalk. Well, where's your sidewalk? I said, it's right here. Uh, my sidewalk is right there. I believe my sidewalk is here. And if I believe it, I'm going to walk on my sidewalk. And I'm inviting you to walk on my sidewalk. Come on out of the house. Robert goes, what? This is crazy. We're walking up and down on the grass. And I said, yes, we're walking on our sidewalk. Guess what? I'm getting a sidewalk. Finances came through in a miraculous and wonderful way. And as soon as the weather permits, I'll be having a sidewalk for you all to walk on. I'm sharing these things with you to say it's as simple as faith in action. Is your sidewalk a fantasy or is your sidewalk faith in action? Is that what you're believing for, a daydream? Or is it really going to be your reality? Will you walk up and down that sidewalk of your life of whatever you're believing for, for healing, for blessing, for the miraculous, for God to unfold something wonderful in your life, for that new job? Will you walk in a way and pathway that says, I believe it so that I have the confidence, the assurance, it is my reality, it is the substance of what I believe and imagine for? If so, it will be yours. Because here's what happens. This passage of Scripture says for us, we do not wish, we know. We do not dream, we state. We do not hope, we accept. We do not pray, we announce. We do not expect something to happen. We believe it has already happened. Amen.